Good morning, all. Thank you very, very much for, uh, for dialing into this presentation. I'm uh, pleased to be here with Mia Ail, joining me. He's in Science Director of Poland. Uh, and we've got um, the results to cover. I think uh, from an over overview and highlights point of view, we all know we've had different markets in 2022. Calendar year was probably the toughest in the investment generation. Uh, we all know that. Uh, but our view is Polo held up well and demonstrated resilience, um, and we've actually had improving performance um, during that period. Uh, we had continued net inflows into our emerging market stars fund and our sustainable thematics fund, mainly um, smart energy. Uh, and we've had further progress with the diversification of our distribution footprint, uh, the opening of our office in Singapore, as we're getting more and more traction um, in Asia with flows um, and the need for client servicing out there. Um, pleasingly, the net outflows from our technology funds, as you know, the largest uh, strategy we have at, at, at Polo. The net outflows have steadily abated over the course of the year. Um, I'll cover that in more detail um, later on. And of course, in the last quarter of the financial year, in other words, the first quarter of uh, this calendar year, AUM actually recovered and rose by 749 million pounds, mainly on the rally in tech stock. So uh, we, we had a very strong start uh, to this current calendar year. The reminder that 20% of our AUM um, is held within closed ended investment trusts. We, we manage three investment trusts a healthcare trust, technology trust, and global financials. That's closed ended um, vehicles. Very comforting to know that doesn't suffer the same vagaries as, as open ended funds. Uh, over the last four years, we've invested quite heavily in digital marketing um, and our brand. Uh, and that's starting to yield results. We've had particularly in good results from the digital marketing uh, campaign we've had over the last two to three years. And all that has led us to have confidence in the business. Um, we have maintained our dividend at 46p. Samir will cover the balance sheet later on. Uh, but we feel confident that we can hold the dividend despite the fact that profits were actually down in the last year, brought about by our de decline in average AUM as markets decline. Um, turning to the next slide, really just to give you a backdrop um, of the, the markets. Um, again, no news to all of you, but effectively those are the major indices that affect uh, the funds we manage here, and you can see all the way through from December 18, pretty, pretty volatile. Uh, the VIX, the uh, volatility and, and risk index has been pretty stable, but you can see DJ World of Technology, the top blue line, really, really sort of ramped up uh, towards the, the latter part of 2021, and of course came all the way back down again, you can see the, the the rally uh, to March 23. Uh, so difficult uh, backdrop. Um, energy obviously the best performing sector last year um, on the back of energy costs going up. Uh, and of course, worst performing last year was uh, was the higher growth tech sector. In terms of the, the, the flow profile per in Europe, um, again, uh, a, a very, very difficult picture. So you can see that's um, the Broadbridge fund file data which tracks from May 2022 all the way through until March 23. Uh, and of course, the equity is represented by the light blue blocks. You can see in outflow all the way through until October last year, and uh, back into inflow in November, December, a good month in January as markets, I think, a slightly better risk off um, uh, approach. And of course, back into outflow February and March. So that's a pan Europe equity fund flows across all the asset classes. So a pretty bleak picture uh, in terms of the industry. Turning now to, uh, to Polar Capital's fund performance. Um, uh, this, this, this slide um, really just shows uh, all of our liver ranked funds. Uh, and the bars effectively showing our performance versus benchmark. So above the horizontal line, is ahead of benchmark, below the line is behind benchmark, and the color of the bar represents first, second, or third quartile. So dark blue being first quartile versus the repair group, lighter blue second quartile, and uh, third quartile. We only have one fund in the third quartile at the moment, and that's UK Value Opportunities. I'll, I'll come back to the reasons for that. Um, the, the placing of the bars left to right, um, the, the, the first launch was global technology, and the most recent launch on right hand side smart mobility. So that's really the timeline of the launch. So you can see the more recently launched funds on the right-hand side of that chart um, have performed very, very strongly um, since inception. 
Uh, however, some of the, the older funds, income opportunities, for example, global insurance, biotech has, has had outstanding performance, I mean, just, just under 8% annualized per annum since, since launch. Uh, phenomenal performance um, for that. So that's a, a fairly strong indication of, of where our performance is um, against benchmark and versus the uh, period. Looking at performance slightly differently um, over different time periods, um, this next slide shows you um, over one year, three year, five year, and since inception, again across all of our uses, um, AUM. Uh, and there you can see over one year, 79% of our, uh, our AUM is actually in first and second quartiles. Uh, over three years, slightly weaker. Um, and the, the reason for that is uh, the technology fund, the largest fund, had a very, very tough 2021. So that's coming to the th three year numbers there, a much better. 22 to 20, early 23. However, over five years, 87% um, of our uh, AUM is first and second quartile, and since inception, 93% first and second quartile. So, very, very strong peer group rankings um, over those, all those time periods. Slightly weaker over three, but we know the reason for that. Looking at it another way, um, and again, this is versus the benchmark, and again, over the various time periods, you can see. Year to date, and obviously the three months that's coming year to date to the end of March, one year, three year, five year since inception. Uh, AUM outperforming, you can see uh, since inception over 80% outperforming benchmark uh, since since inception. The light blue chart really is just is the percentage of the, of the funds as opposed to the percentage of AUM. So again, a very, very strong uh, picture of, of, of performance. Peter Polo, um, and, and you all are aware that sort of the, the three differentiators for Polo Capital are capacity management uh, to enhance and defend performance. I think that's absolutely key. So we do talk about capacity quite a lot. Uh, the other differentiator for Polo is autonomous investment teams. So 13 teams in total. They all have their own process, their own investment philosophy, and they all, all are um, autonomous from an investment point of view. In fact, there's a very strong centralized oversight. Uh, and the third differentiator is obviously a very transparent compensation structure for our fund managers that, that, that enables performance and retention. But just turning to capacity for a minute, um, we do watch our capacity uh, because we do have limited capacity. We're currently managing, um, as you know, just under um, 20 billion pounds, uh, and total capacity is 60 billion. So you can see total remaining capacity across all of those strategies is about 40 billion, twice of what we currently manage. Now, I think that the really interesting fact um, is um, the capacity in those funds that are actually benefiting from the inflows at the moment. So those strategies include healthcare, sustainable thematic, emerging market stars in Asia, and European income. So, so those four are benefiting as we speak and benefited last year from the inflows. And the capacity, the remaining capacity in those four strategies is 23 billion pounds. And again, that gave us the confidence to, 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 to go slightly uncovered in the dividend and maintain the dividend uh, for, la for last year. Turning now to, to AUM and flows more specifically, um, that chart really just shows you the, the, the AUM profile through from March 2019 through until June, and that's actually the 16th of June, the slide. So you can see March 23, our year in AUM was 19.2, and that rose slightly to just a tick under 20 billion um, on the 16th of June. Uh, the light blue line represents average AUM, and Samir will refer to that later on because that's really what drives our revenue, is the average AUM during the course of the financial period. Uh, and the red line uh, we put on there really just out of curiosity, and that, that's the MSCR All Country World Index in Sterling. Uh, and you can see pretty close correlation of our, of our AUM to the actual MSCI index over that, that period of time. Um, where the lines diverge or converge, that's effectively because of consequences of outflows or poor inflows. Turning now to um, specific inflows and outflows in the 12 month period, you can see um, 1.5 billion pounds of net outflows in total uh, across our, 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 all of our funds, of which 1.2 was technology alone. So, technology really dominated uh, the group's net outflows. Um, on the, on the positive side, EM stars on the left hand, you can see inflows of over 200 million, sustainable thematic inflows of over 100 million, European income had inflows, healthcare 
uh, it's pretty static, but actually one denies that is we've had very good inflows into biotech, but that's been balanced off by outflows from the healthcare opportunities fund. So, so these look at the entire strategy, let's look at individual funds. Healthcare um, has had a very, very good run in terms of biotech uh, demand for, for, for that fund. Uh, but of course, technology uh, is, is the key one here. Um, and like all managed technology funds, we all suffered last year as tech sort of. Uh, UK Value has been a very difficult area, our UK Value Opportunities Fund, fantastic team. Uh, and that's really dominated by one particular UK wealth manager redeeming by reducing their weighting to UK equity. So we've seen this theme coming through throughout the course of the year is that uh, wealth managers are reducing their UK equity weightings, uh, they come right down to the lowest they've ever been. And of course, we suffer from that because they reduce their, their holdings and our, our funds. Uh, Melchior Selected Trust, that's our European Opportunities Fund. Uh, that had outflows and again, really driven by our sentiment about European stocks, and that, that's a consequence of what's happening in, um, in Ukraine um, and Eastern Europe. So, again, that's, that's um, the sentiment of that as a class. Turning the page on, it's more on technology because that has dominated. What, what, what this um, slide shows is the quarterly net inflows and outflows from our tech strategies. Now, we, we run three tech vehicles. We run a, a, an open-ended use vehicle, which is the largest. Uh, we run a, a, an investment trust. So these numbers will include share buybacks and share issuances when it's a premium. And we also run an automation and artificial intelligence fund, which we launched over five years ago. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But you can see uh, what's happened here. So in Q2 of 2020, uh, we had 790 million pounds of net inflow into technology. So the, the so-called COVID winners, and as we all know, tech was a beneficiary of that by, 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 by far. So in that one quarter alone, 790 million pounds of inflows, 560 in the next quarter, 190 million, and then 300 million in Q1 of 2021. And of course, then the whole sort of COVID uh, winners turned into COVID losers. We started seeing outflows as investors reduced their weighting. Uh, to technology. And of course, that kind of big tech sell as inflation started to become a reality, as interest rates are rising, your higher value growth stocks then sold off. So we saw the consequence of clients reducing weightings in Q1 of 2022, where we saw 660 million pounds of net outflows in that one quarter. But that compares to 790 in Q2 of 2020. And then since that first quarter of 2022, we've seen a steady decline in net quarterly outflows from tech um, all the way through uh, until Q1 of, of, of this year, uh, where 240 million outflows. And, and I can say the current quarter, which we report on in a couple of weeks' time, uh, it's reduced even further. So we're seeing, I think, the inflection point where tech will actually finally get down to zero in, zero out, and possibly, hopefully, turn back into inflow um, as sentiment uh, changes. I'm now going to ask um, Samir to cover the, the financial uh, review, and then I'll take over from Samir on the strategy. Thank you, Gavin. Good morning, everyone. Um, the finance slides follow the same format they have um, recently. I look at the summary of the financial performance, which is really the PL focus. Um, we look at the cost base, um, and then we move on to looking at the balance sheet and round off with the conversation on the um, uh, really extending what Gavin said earlier, difficult market conditions for most of the financial year are really the backdrop to these numbers, and therefore, unsurprisingly, most financial metrics, as you can see, are, are down year on year. Um, in terms of helping understand the, the three main components of our profitability and therefore PL, um, the first one is core operating profits. Um, uh, and core operating profits are effectively net management fee. Um, less um, operating costs related to generating those revenues. And core operating profits came in, in at just under 48 million for the year, core operating profit margin of 31%. And really, core operating profit is driven by one of the first um, great uh, drivers of the business, which is average AUM. And as you can see, as a result of lower valuations and net outflows, average AUM for the financial year was 19.6 billion, which was lower than last year. And that combined with our anticipated lower um, net management fee yield across the financial year resulted in net management fees being lower at 155 million. 
our guidance for net management fee yield going forward remains at, um, at expecting one to two basis points of compression each year. Um, and that is partly a function of the fact that we are not immune from industry pressures, but really the thing that's driving this more order here is a change in product mix to some extent this financial year, where we are um, taking inflows into our more recently launched strategies um, for our smart energy, for example, um, and the EM star strategy in the US at exceeding margin rates. Um, and that is um, on the other side, um, affected by net outflows from technology, which is one of our mature, higher margin products. Um, and again, as things settle down and as sentiment changes and flow starts coming back into technology, that margin mix may alter the other way again. So therefore, a one to two basis point compression looking ahead over the medium term seems reasonable at this point. So core operating profit margin, really a combination of lower average AUM um, and net management fee um, being lower this year, therefore, um, uh, is a combination of those factors. The other component of profitability is performance fee profits. Most of our funds have a uh, charge a performance fee, and really that um, line being lower this year at roughly two odd million is really a reflection on how difficult it has been for our teams um, to uh, generate um, relative performance um, in an environment where there have been headwinds against anything that is um, a growth strategy and anything that is not purely large cap focused. The third component of our profitability is other income, and that line houses mark-to-market gains and losses um, on our seed portfolio, net of hedging costs, and for the first time in a long time, um, some interest income on our cash balances. So pulling those three components of um, the PNL and profitability together, adjusted total earnings per share for the year were 44.3p, and total dividend for the year, 46p. And I'll come on to the dividend, as I said, towards the end of the slides, um, finance slides to speak about that in a bit more detail. But if we move on to the next slide, um, we take a look at the cost base of the organization in a little bit more detail. And essentially, total operating costs for the business um, have come down 16% um, year on year. And that, as the bar chart on the right shows, is really a reflection of variable compensation costs coming down. Staff compensation costs are a large part of our operating costs. And a reminder that we do run a, a model whereby it is a profit sharing model whereby our teams access uh, a share of both the management fee or core profitability that they generate as well as performance fee profits that they generate. And therefore, as profits increase or decrease, their share increases or decreases this as well and therefore really um, lower variable staff compensation costs is the main driver to, uh, behind total costs going down. Other operating costs increase very marginally um, and exceptional costs decrease year on year and on the next slide we look at both those two lines in a bit more detail. First taking a look at other operating costs and really the message areas research and travel being higher year on year is really the driver for that marginal increase there. Um, but for context, I've put up there um, a, a, an indicator to say, even though that those two lines are where we have done more activity this year, driving some of that increase, but also where we are feeling some of the inflationary pressure that is again out there and that we are not immune from across those two lines. But in terms of context, our spend this year is actually in line with what we were spending pre-COVID in 2019 across those two lines to just provide um, our shareholders with context and how we think about and manage cost over multi-year periods. Looking at exceptional items on the right-hand side, um, the uh, main message is that our legal case with FPA vendors um, of the Phaeacian transaction has been settled and the vast bulk of those exceptional items house not only the settlement but all legal costs associated with that as well as looking ahead a provision for closing down the legal structure around Phaeacian and 
some more costs around closing down self scaled open funds. Um, and that is the, the reason for the, uh, the exception items that we see this year. Um, moving on, we look at the first of two slides looking at the balance sheet. And really, the message around our strong balance sheet is that cash and seed investments of 150 million at the uh, year end. We do see new um, emerging product ideas, um, and we seeded and supported four, uh, seven funds at the end of the year. Uh, post year end, smart energy seed money has been recycled, and we will use that to seed other uh, interesting ideas that we have in the pipeline over the, the coming months, the coming year. A reminder that our seed investments are hedged for currency and market exposures overall. Looking at the next slide, we look at the strength of the balance sheet um, in another um, way, surplus capital over and above our regulatory capital requirement, as well as dividend provision at the end of the year, roughly around 58 million. So again, a good healthy position. The bar chart on the left um, provides a picture of how capital allocation looks across the balance sheet. And essentially the message there is capital allocation has not changed year on year. And the diagram on the bottom right hand side of that slide um, really messages again the framework or the way we think about use of capital and really consistent um, with that we will continue to see new product ideas we will continue to buy back shares into our ebt to mitigate the impact of share incentive schemes and the dilution of those we will continue to maintain and use our balance sheet for navigating challenging market conditions and the future growth of the business and continue to look to return capital to um, share, shareholders to our ordinary dividends. And with that, moving on to the next slide, really by maintaining the second intro dividend at 32p, um, and therefore the full year dividend at 46p, um, that compares against total earnings for this financial year of 44.3p, so marginally uncovered um, by just a shade under 2p. Um, but as Gavin mentioned, that is a reflection of our confidence in the medium term outlook of the business, but also the strength of the balance sheet. And what do I mean by that? Some context um, will, will help um, you understand our thinking. Every one PO dividend that is declared and paid by the company is roughly a, a million pounds in cash outlay for the, for the organization. So that small marginal uncovered position this year um, is easily managed with our. Um, uh, our strong balance sheet, um, uh, and therefore uh, the message really looking out ahead is that no change in the way we think about the dividend just yet, and we look out with confidence, um, uh, both in terms of the outlook, strength of the balance sheet, as we navigate the next financial year coming up. And talking about outlook, I will pass back on to Gavin now to run through the outlook and strategy. Thank, thank you, Samir. So um, just you now turning to strategy, I mean, it's, it's been the strategic intent for the last six years to actually grow with diversity collection is actually key. Um, often these businesses succeed in one area and become quite concentrated, and, and that was the case with Polar. Uh, that slide just shows you our five largest strategies, but 13, that's those are five largest in terms of AUM. And you can see the five largest um, in 2020, we represented 90% of AUM. Now we represent 81% of AUM. Tech uh, was as high as 56% of our total AUM in 2020. That's March 2020. It rose even higher during the first early COVID years. And it's now 37%. And the reason is, is we've had our growth valuations come down in tech, but also, crucially, we've had net inflows um, into the other successful strategies. So healthcare has grown from 16% to 20%. Emerging market stars increased from 8 to 11 percent, uh, and so on and so forth. Global insurance from 5 to 7. Um, so it really has um, made some good progress on that. The next slide, um, again, um, it just shows you sort of a slightly longer term context um, on those five large strategies. And even, even with the big tech settled and the outflows, the compound annual growth rate in the technology strategy has been 16.9 percent over that period of time from 2019 to 2023. You can see growing from 4.5 billion of AUM, peaking at 10.2 in 2021, 
and back down at 7.2 million um, in 2023. So still a very impressive compounding of growth rate, 16.9%. Healthcare, even better at 18.5% compound growth, rising from 2.2 billion uh, of total AUM in healthcare to 3.8. Global insurance, which had a spectacular year last year. So in a, in a tough investment environment of the calendar 2022, global insurance fund actually achieved absolute uh, positive returns of well over 20%, so phenomenal. So that fund has grown from 1.2 billion, uh, peaked at 1.9, peaked at 1, sorry, 2.1, uh, and that represents 13.1% of compounding growth. Emerging market stars, um, second from the bottom, that has um, grown from 157 million uh, to 1.3 billion. Uh, and just to put that in context, that, that strategy was launched in the summer of 2018. So yes, it is off a lower base, which is why that 70% K guys is, is such a high number. But I think the, the more important feature about emerging markets is, is this entire period uh, of growing this strategy within Polo. Uh, is within the context of emerging markets equities being in outflow. So, so as, as, as an asset class, emerging markets have actually been in outflow. So we've managed to achieve what we've done for this team uh, by capturing market share because the asset class actually has been in decline over that period of time. So it's all about market share uh, performance uh, and, a, and a very, very um, sustainable process in terms of what they do in the emerging markets. UK value opportunities, again, the UK value fund um, is, is fairly small mid-cap focused, and we all know what's happened to the small mid-cap UK companies. I mean, they, they've all sold off. Uh, we've suffered liquidity, and this fund has been, been no exception. So this fund grew from 856 million, it peaked at 1.6 billion in 2022, and it's come back down to 1.2, mainly as a consequence of, uh, of outflows, but also valuations have come down. Uh, quite significantly for those in UK mid cap companies in the portfolio, but still an impressive 12.4% compound in growth over, over that period of time. Um, we are very, very um, focused uh, on closing down um, funds that are no longer commercially viable um, and, of course, launching funds where there is client demand. Uh, often it's client led, looking for certain investment ideas. You can see uh, the bottom half of that chart really just shows you what has been launched since 2018 and below the line what we've actually closed down. So it's so very, very active in terms of the housekeeping aspect of project capital. And this allows us to, to really focus on growth areas uh, and not be bogged down by, by those funds that um, are just taking capacity and, and, and not ever going to be performing or raising assets. So you can see a lot of activity across there. Uh, currently, what is uh, is planned for 2023 uh, is an emerging markets ex-China fund, both in uh, European use format, but also 48 mutual funds in the US market. And that's really to meet uh, client demand who want to invest in emerging markets but are nervous about China, or who actually want to rather invest in China directly. Uh, and this gives those clients the, the optionality of, of, of doing that. We're also launching a European small cap fund, which is run by our European forager team, which is a long short fund. Clients have said uh, they really like what the team does, but actually they wanted a long only version. Um, so, so that's um, earmarked for the launch um, in the next couple of months. Turning to, to distribution for a second, I mean, very, very important. And I think before we get to, to distribution, just a quick word on um, artificial intelligence. Uh, and I think here there's been a lot of press, a lot of uh, publicity about AI since ChatGPT became a big feature and publicly available late last year. Uh, and a project by like Ben Roloff, co headed on the tech team, the breakthrough in artificial intelligence represents one of the most exciting developments in technology yet. We believe this is akin to the commercialization of the internet, smartphones, and the launch of the, of the cloud. Uh, this is pretty, pretty fundamental stuff, um, and we're getting a lot of incoming queries, inquiries, a lot of interest in AI and how Polar addresses this now. AI is not new to Polar. It's been one of the key, key um, eight verticals within the, sort of the whole technology strategy. Uh, and we did launch uh, an AI fund five and a half years ago. So we do have a five-year track record um, within our automation and artificial intelligence fund. Uh, it's a very, very good, good track record, top decile since inception. 
Uh, and we see a, a lot of interest um, in clients looking specifically at AI as a, as a theme. And of course, AI will, will benefit uh, other strategies as well. I, mean, I think healthcare stands to benefit from, from AI over time, the healthcare provision uh, from, from AI, particularly generative AI, the sort of new uh, technology that's really becoming available more widely. So, very, very exciting. Polar's well, well placed um, in the whole AI revolution, you have to call it that. And we're not just reacting to current publicity. This has actually been there for well over five years, and we're well recognized on that. Uh, battery distribution, um, it's all very well having uh, funds that perform very well, but you've actually got to connect uh, those products with uh, a growing client base. And, and we've, we've invested in uh, digital marketing over the last four years, and this is really yielding results right now. So, you know, we do have um, a mutual fund in the US. Uh, more than half of our net inflows into our emerging markets funds came from the US investors last year. So, well over 100 million pounds to our mutual fund. Uh, the Nordic region has become key for us. Uh, this we bought from the zero start four years ago. Uh, and we've got a regional presence planned for Stockholm um, in the last quarter of this year. So, so it's a very, very exciting key area for us. Uh, and we have now established an office in Singapore to serve as a growing client base um, in Asia. And in fact, the whole of Asia packs in that, in that time zone. So um, very much more diversified distribution uh, across the globe. Just a bit, a bit more about brand, um, which is very, very important. So the whole change in how you sell and market your products um, to the client base out there. Um, and I think a combination of digitalization uh, and also working with patents post-COVID has meant that you've got to rely much more on digital marketing. Um, and over, over the year, we've really made good progress as Polar, uh, and we're in the Broadbridge Fund Rank 50 rankings. Uh, you can see, um, and you, this is what our clients say. This is, what, this is our clients saying what they believe Polar is uh, against the UK peer group. Seventh in terms of overall brand score, third in terms of sales and account management, second in terms of client-oriented thinking, and first in thematic equity. So that's first across all of our UK peers uh, in thematic equity. So for, for, for small polar, we are by far the smallest uh, fund group in this uh, broad fund rate 50. Uh, so we're very, very pleased with where we've got to our whole brand um, of our business. The next, the next slide really um, just shows you where we've got to in terms of marketing and communication. So again, this is uh, our client's survey coming back to Broadbridge and effectively we've gone from number 17 in the UK to number six in terms of what our clients think we are in terms of marketing and communication. So really making a big impact. And then just to round off, just conscious of time, we've been going for half an hour now, which just to, to round off um, in terms of outlook before I take any questions. Um, current AUM is now above the average AUM from last year. So that's looking uh, quite good. Uh, the growth of diversification strategy is yielding results, both within distribution and as you saw with our fund strategy. So the largest five uh, and the remaining so eight or nine really, really growing behind that. Uh, we have increased our centralized ESG results to give teams more support. Uh, and of course, the majority of our eligible funds are articulated in the last line. Um, despite the fact we have significant remaining capacity, um, we are still looking for new teams. Um, we, we do want to add more teams, more capacity in complementary areas. So international equities is a specific area we're looking at, preferably with a value tilt. Um, there are conversations on go as we speak. Uh, and that's all really focused on demand in the US market for our, for our US sales team and with a mutual fund range. Strong value sheet, as Samir said, um, in order to maintain the dividend. Um, we still have a very, very strong manager going forward into the next financial year. Um, and of course, the remaining capacity in those four strategies that are actually currently in or in inflow gives us a lot of confidence um, going forward. So I think on that, I'll, I'll pause um, and uh, take any questions you might have. Do you think you can maintain the dividend over the next few years? Oh, sure. <laughs> Shall I take that? You take it on. So I, I want to repeat the sort of context that I provided. And really, um, the the balance sheet we have set for a number of years, um, we we maintain um, cash on the balance sheet and, and and assets to navigate markets exactly like this. Um, relatively straightforward decision this year for the board and the company, as I said, uncovered by roughly two odd P. 
Um, uh, and each 1p of dividend is a million pounds of, of cash outlay. So that provides sort of context for people looking ahead, trying to do their sensitivity analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Polar has um, done this before and leading to shareholders that have been with us for the long journey. Um, in 2017, we went uncovered um, by 5p when earnings were 20p and we were running 9 odd billion in, uh, in AUM. Cash was 60 odd billion. And really, the message there is uh, look, as an FD, I don't particularly want to make a habit of this, but we have um, done what we've said. Um, uh, and really, the business now is in a much more balanced and healthier position it is. So we look out over this immediate financial year where we are, we're only just starting the financial year. And as Gavin said, we have visibility of inflows into some really core strategies, four core strategies. We can see outflows from technology abating as we speak. So that really gives us quite a confidence on, on the medium term outlook for the business. Um, and we're focused on things that we can control in terms of doing the right things, growing the business for shareholders and all stakeholders. Um, and therefore, we look out with confidence in, uh, for this financial year where we're taking things period to period. Thank you. Um, on the subject of distribution, um, how can you maximize uh, available distribution um, channels to grow AUM? What role will digitization play within this? And what more can you be doing? Yeah, so I mean, uh, very much targeted marketing. So, um, you know, very thoughtful pieces go out to our client base, which they can then use um, to get to their client base. Remember, our, our clients are generally intermediaries wealth managers, private banks. Um, so what we tend to do is, 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 is put out thought, thought pieces. Uh, one went out last week on AI, for example, was very, very well received, very much appreciated. Uh, the week before, a piece went out from the emerging market team on Vietnam uh, and what opportunities that country offers in terms of growth. So it's very much sort of uh, developing that targeted marketing. Uh, much more use of conferences. So um, we, we really have ramped up our, our presence um, and participation presentations at conferences across the globe. Um, so, you know, in US conferences we're presenting at now, uh, Europe, Europe, UK. So it's, it's all of that. Um, and certainly the view, I think, from our, our, our head of distribution here and head of marketing is that um, what's changed in the last five years is 70% of the decision to actually buy a fund is made before you even see the fund manager. Because it's all available. It's all available on the net, it's all available on databases. Um, you know what the polar fund's been doing, what's been performing like it compared it to its peer group and so on and so forth. So there's a lot more involved in terms of the pre-sale than there was in the past. I mean, in the past five, 10 years ago, you used to get on the road with your fund manager and you go to a sort of grand tour of the UK to the branches of the stockbrokers around the country. That's no longer the case because most of it is now centralised in terms of centralised um, analysis uh, and it's much more industry um, focused. Thank you. Um, how much management fee compression do you expect in the next three years? So where we sit now, um, one to two at the very least, um, yeah, our basic points of fee compression is to be expected. Um, uh, unless we see things changing in the wider marketplace or within uh, within the experience of the portfolio, and then we will change our guidance. But at the moment, one to two basis points of fee erosion a year to be expected. Okay. And I guess, leaving on from that, um, margins are declining across the industry. Do you think this will continue over the medium term? I think that's it. No answer really. As I said very, very briefly during the presentation, I think we, we're not immune to it. There is only one direction for this, unfortunately, even uh, for active asset managers. Uh, and we just need to make sure that we are very sensible in terms of how we manage the business, which um, hopefully shareholders can see that we've done um, across multi-years. And really um, that we remain focused on our on our um, sweet spot, as it were. We are a very uh, focused thematic house. And, and therefore, by focusing on thematic strategies that we can offer our client base, um, which are institutions and intermediaries, um, and they can use those as building blocks for their end clients, um, and they can't access elsewhere that expertise, 
we feel confident in being able to be able to charge a premium for that. But I think that being understand that is, is, is if you're offering a differentiated product, uh, which is not easily available elsewhere, you can defend your margins better. Uh, so it's all about differentiation, um, and it's also about uh, and as we said earlier on, we, we do manage capacity, so there is limited capacity in these funds, and that has the um, effect of protecting the revenue margin. Okay, well, I have a question to lead on from that. Thank you, Gavin. Can you give more detail around your methodology used to calculate AUM capacity? So it's a combination of, of, of factors. I mean, the starting point is underlying portfolio liquidity. Clearly. So if, you, if, you, if you're managing a, uh, a small cap UK fund, investing in UK small cap companies, clearly your capacity can be much lower than if you're running uh, a, a large cap uh, UK strategy. Uh, so that, that's a starting point. Um, the other key feature um, on capacity is the extent to which your fund managers and the team can actually service the client base. So, 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 so what we do is, is, is we are paid by our clients to, to A, outperform, uh, but also to provide them with the key information that they can use for their clients. So effectively, it's the knowledge that they get. Uh, and you can only really translate that knowledge from your key fund managers to your clients if you know how many clients you've got. So, for example, technology fund, which we soft closed actually uh, back in 2021, we saw those inflows. Yeah. And the reason for that was not capacity at all. Obviously, obviously there's massive capacity in mega cap tech companies. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, liquidity at all uh, that we soft closed. It was actually client bandwidth. And we did not want the fund managers to be distracted by having to spend huge amounts of time. Uh, servicing a growing client base. So we allowed existing clients to increase their, their holdings, but we were not taking on new clients into the technology fund. So the two reasons for, for, for uh, calculating tech capacity, one is unlined liquidity, the other is client service. Thank you. Right, well, leading on from that then, uh, if we're talking about the, the established funds, if we moved on to the new funds, uh, what is the performance and the AUM threshold for a new fund to avoid closure? And what is your time frame for evaluation? Okay, well, it's, it's, it's different on, on each of the new funds, depending on, on when they launch, what they do, what the client demand is. Um, I mean, for example, um, uh, 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 in the presentation pack, there was a, a chart. Uh, we launched Emerging Market Stars. Um, Which a, page what, is this on, Gavin? 35. So it's the, it's the it's the LIPA rankings of all of our funds uh, since inception. So it's over one year, three year, five year, and that's its inception. That one, yeah, exactly. So um, um, EM Stars was launched in the summer of 2018. Um, we all remember that last quarter of 2018 was really, really difficult for equities, and particularly emerging markets. Um, we didn't want to delay the launch, but we wanted to get, get going. But of course, they had a very, very tough first six months because they, they sold it, they, they, they launched into a big drawdown in terms of all markets and and EM. And that probably put them back by at least a year in terms of, 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 of uh, gaining new plants. Just plants were already seen, they are going to recover, or they're going to perform their polo. The team have been running billions um, at the previous um, employer. Uh, but of course, clients are back and went and say, well, we want the fund to get a certain size, they don't want to see the performance recover. Uh, but despite all of that, I mean, that, that, that fund is now uh, close to a billion pounds, and that's over a 500 year period when we've actually seen outflows from the region. So we've actually gained market share. Uh, we've also had to build a completely new distribution channel in, in the Nordic uh, region because that, that's where the team was recognized. They came from, uh, from Denmark. So, uh, you know, those are the factors that affected that. Um, UK Value, they joined us in, uh, in 2017 much quicker. Team had a very, very good profile within the UK intermediate market. Uh, we saw clients switching almost immediately, um, and that was much, much quicker. So they probably got to capacity within three years um, of the launch. Smart Energy, um, again, you know, that was launched in September 2021. Uh, so right into this big sort of drawdown, a whole sort of growth rate rating, a uh, tough time launch, but they had good performance. Uh, and that team and our managing million across the, the two funds. So a good start um, and traction only really is going to build now. To your question about how long do we give the teams, um, we're very patient. Um, you, 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 you can't judge a team on short-term performance. You've got to understand 
demand the environment, uh, the demand, um, what the drivers of performance are. Um, so we will tend to give up to five years to see whether the teams actually going to make it or not. Um, and if it's if it's not, um, there's a conversation to be had because often it doesn't work, the team it doesn't work, the program. So it's, it's almost sort of a, a self-correcting model in that if the, the AUM doesn't grow, uh, it means the team not going to be remunerated. Thank you. Uh, this might be like asking you to choose your favourite child, but um, which strategy do you expect to be a winner this year? Uh, in terms of flows or performance? Oh, <laughs> they haven't specified. Uh, perhaps you could choose for each. Uh, well, what tends to happen is I go hand in hand. So if you have a winner from a performance point of view, it generally actually gains uh, assets and trade and traction as well. Um, I, I mean, I would say. Um, Emerging markets uh, in an environment of a weakening US dollar, that's generally good for emerging markets. I think we've had a, a fantastic run on the dollar um, that is reverting now, uh, which means that's positive for emerging markets. So, so certainly, uh, we're, we're expecting great things from our emerging markets. It's got a, a, a fantastic track record. I mean, again, looking at that page 35, and uh, EM stars um, is. Um, Sixth percentile since inception, uh, top quartile over three years. It's right in the sweet spot. It's got critical mass. Um, it's got a fantastic team. Uh, we've actually broadened the team, so a lot of clients are actually look for more coverage of emerging markets. Um, particularly, as I said earlier, launching an EMX China strategy. If you take China out of the emerging market index, you get that with a very different index, um, and all of a sudden. India becomes a much bigger component, for example, Latin America becomes a much bigger component. So we've actually addressed that by opening uh, an office and having a, a research capability in Mumbai. Uh, we've also um, hired an analyst covering specifically in Latin America. So um, I think we're very, very well positioned. I mean, I've, certainly our internal expectation is the, 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 the biggest, um, uh, I think the biggest opportunity we've got at the moment is for our emerging markets team, then probably smart energy given where we are smart energy and i think um artificial intelligence i think that, that that's the other big one i think we're going to see clients really really focusing back on technology but really honing in on on what is ai actually going to do who's going to be the winners of ai who's going to be the users what are the disruptors going to be so i think across those three um healthcare again um, we've had tremendous flows into the biotech fund uh healthcare run four very different strategies within the healthcare team they were a biotech fund, a healthcare opportunities fund, which is much more sort of mid cap focused and growth here. They were a healthcare blue chip fund, which is focused on large cap pharma. So that, that appeals to a very, very different healthcare client to, for example, biotech. Uh, and then in January 2020, we launched a healthcare discovery fund, which really focuses on those emerging healthcare companies, smaller cap, that are generating profits and so on. So that's for the sort of the higher risk. Healthcare investors. So we offer quite a broad range of, of, of strategies within healthcare to appeal to quite a broad range of, of, of client capabilities. So we think healthcare is another area that's going to be a big interest. And of course, you know, demographics is changing globally, uh, and aging demographic points to more spend on healthcare. So we're well placed um, to capture that. Thank you. Um, a question around um, inflationary uh, pressures on wages. Um, how is hiring retention at the moment? And can you please provide some perspective in a longer term context? So uh, reflecting back on, on last year, again, um, we were quite early in, in sort of contemplating what that meant for our, our more junior operational uh, staff members. Um, and there we tried to cushion them by, by doing more in base. And now remember, I'm talking about um, uh, junior operational staff members. So the, the core of the organization, uh, the fund management teams, as I mentioned earlier, um, they're on a very uh, well understood um, profit sharing model. They understand that they are uh, beholden to how well they perform for their end clients, and therefore um, they get remunerated um, on a on a like for like basis. Um, uh, our teams do well for funds and the underlying clients, and therefore Cora does well and they do well in turn. Uh, 
Um, there is not a lot of pressure there. Um, we've got a well-defined um, model, and that remains um, intact for the for the to looking out. Um, is there going to be continued pressure? There is in the current marketplace. Is that impacting us um, uh, to a greater extent, extent than others? I, I don't believe it. It has. I think we've navigated the early pressures last year well. Um, it hasn't impacted morale. Adversely, it hasn't impacted turnover adversely, and we feel in a relatively good position um, to navigate um, possible continued um, uh, stress over the coming months. Thank you. Um, I think this is the last one, a little, uh, I'm sure it's on your website under the investor section, but how many shares do the management and staff own? So I think um, roughly 25 to 30 percent off the top of my head is, is held um, uh, by a combination of uh, um, staff members, directors, ex um, PMs, existing PMs, etc. So a, a fairly um, concentrated amount of uh, in the hands of polar or ex polar um, individuals. Thank you. Right. Well, that's it from the questions. So thank you both very much for uh, joining us today and talking us through your results. Thank you to our audience for your contributions. And we look forward to catching up in six months time. Thank, thank you. you very much, thank everyone. You. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.